Hello everyone, welcome back. We are continuing our journey here in AP World History and today we are going to start talking about empires. We're going to get to the point where we start to see the growth of large empires and it's a new type of government structure that we've talked about and one we are going to talk about a lot throughout the year. Now, let's talk a little bit about the difference between an empire and a city-state. First and foremost, empires are much larger. We're going to talk, be talking about areas that are thousands of square miles and control huge, huge amounts of land. Two, ethnic pride in dominant group. In an empire, group A, if you will, conquers groups B, C, D, and depending how powerful they are, like say the Mongols, they'll conquer all the way to like group Z. You need to be unified. You have a strong group of people that have a focus and they can conquer others. Next thing we have is the empire will be multi-ethnic or will be diverse. You're going to be seeing empires that are conquering lots of different types of people and we'll talk about the issues that can arise due to that. Number four, increased or expanded economy. The only reason you can get an empire this big is that you have a strong economy and that you make money. Why? Because of number five. You need a strong and large army, hence the army men. You need to be dominant militarily if you're going to conquer someone else. And after you conquer them, you need to stay in control. So you put that all together, that's what you've got. And our first group that's going to do that, and some people say it's the first ever, although I think the Egyptians will have something to say to that, will be the Akkadians. And this empire will be started by their great ruler, if you will, Sargon. This was an empire that you see lasted for a little less than 200 years, which back in the day is a pretty good run from 2334 to 2150 BCE. And as you can see on the map, controlling an area surrounding the uh, Persian Gulf all the way through the Fertile Crescent into modern-day Syria. Now, Sargon was a really interesting guy. Uh, he was a military leader who actually led a coup against the king of Akkad and was able to go on a run to conquer lots of people. But in order to do that, you need a great reputation. So Sargon spread the idea that he was actually descended from the gods and that he was divine. This idea of divine kings or kings that rule by divine law is something we're going to talk about a lot in the future. Now, one of the reasons why Sargon had so much power is he controlled trade routes which gave him lots and lots of money, hence the reigning money. Um, as you can see on the map here, you can see that there was trade between Sumer and the Indus Valley, even into uh, Crete and northern Africa. And it was Sargon that controlled this. This gave him the money to run his empire. This gave the money for him to support his army, and thus the empire was born. Unfortunately for him, it didn't last that long. By the time of his great-grandsons, they're just not as good. And that's the problem that we're going to talk about in the future. When you have an empire that is run by one guy, and it's hereditary, you got a 50-50 shot. That one guy could be good, that one guy could be bad. Unfortunately for Sargon's heirs, they weren't very good and they fell apart due to internal revolt. But that's okay. There was a group that was going to be able to take over for them a couple hundred years after their fall, and that would be the Babylonians. Babylon, as you can see there with the mouse giving that a big circle, Babylon would rise up around 2000 BCE, and the leaders of Babylon would uh, consolidate their control and then they just followed the model of the Akkadians. They had a great army, they started to grow in trade and power, and they started to conquer. But this old Babylonian empire, because there's going to be a new one, is important really because of one guy. This man right here, Hammurabi. Hammurabi was a king, he was actually one of the first people that took the title of the king of the world, and Hammurabi did something really, really special. 
he made a law code. I know it sounds kind of boring, but being that our society is based off of law, this was kind of important. And the theme behind his law is Lex Talionis, or the Law of Retaliation. It's real simple. Okay, so what is the big deal here? First and foremost, this is the first written law code we have. I'm sure there were other law codes. I'm sure rulers and judges existed, but this one was written down. And that's really important because when you write it down, it's easier to spread. Secondly, the laws were based on social standing. So in other words, the richer you were or the more status you had, often you had lesser penalties for laws, but they still applied to all people. So all nobles, all commoners, it really didn't matter who you were, the laws, there were laws that addressed all people in the empire. Number three, they actually had laws to address taxation and minimum wage. No, it was not Franklin Roosevelt that gave us our first minimum wage. It was Hammurabi who set the minimum wage for specific jobs and other types of work that was done in the empire. Pretty big deal. Then we had laws on behavior and inheritances. You Then, this is a big deal, the presumption of innocence. Some people always say it was the Romans that did it first. No, in Hammurabi's code, you were presumed innocent, and both sides were allowed to present, present evidence. So you got to defend yourself, which later law codes would not allow. Then judges were trained and were able to use precedent to apply law. In other words, they could look at the law, they could interpret the law, see how the law had been used before, and use it. A big deal. But, in the end, this law was very brutal. Uh, the most famous phrase from this is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So, for instance, if you stole something and you were of a commoner, they would cut your hands off. If you built a house and that house fell down and killed somebody, you would die. Most of the laws resulted in severe beatings or death. But, hey, it's the first law code, one of the most important moments in history. Now, after the Babylonians fell for the first time, the Assyrians came in. And the Assyrians were all about one thing, military conquest. They quite literally kill everybody and wreck shop. This is a phrase that I will use throughout the year, and wrecking shop simply refers to this. As you can see there, this is a Mongol warrior one, but this is just complete dominance. And the Assyrians did exactly that. As you can see here, they established a huge empire going from the Persian Gulf all the way to Egypt, and they did it by killing everybody. If you see here, their greatest king, Ashurbanipal, he's holding a lion in a headlock. When you hold a lion in a headlock, you are pretty much awesome. And the Assyrians built beautiful cities, and they just dominated everybody. Here's some pictures of Nineveh, his capital. This is what's left today. Here's another picture of the Great Gate. But that's what it would have looked like 3,500 years ago. Pretty awesome. Now the Assyrians, and, and here is his palace. Now the Assyrians, as you can see there, they were incredibly violent. Much of their artwork depicts them destroying people. As you see on the left, they're clubbing people to death. As you see there on the right, actually what they're doing is flaying those people alive, which means that they're skinning them. It, it is pretty simple, guys. If you beat everybody and make them scared of you, you can rule them. But oddly enough, they were also really big on learning, okay, and libraries. It is the Assyrians who developed the world's first cataloged library, which, of course, allows us to look for books today. Or for you guys, you just look it up online. But to give you an idea of how important a library, well, that is a picture of Ashurbanipal's library, so clearly it was important. Now, our final empire was the Neo-Babylon Empire, or Part 2, from 620 to 539 BC. And as you can see, this is a huge empire if you look at all the different people there. But the fact of the matter is, is this empire is really known for just a couple things. One, their beautiful city. 
This is a picture of Babylon. You can see it's incredibly huge. They had city walls. They had um, a canal running through it. Things you really didn't see in the world at that time. Secondly, they're known for destroying Jerusalem. It was under King Nebuchadnezzar, who was actually Nebuchadnezzar II, in the 500s BCE, um, was able to destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple, which we'll talk more about that later. But this would be very important in the Jewish faith for some things that we will turn known for the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which was the best gift to a wife ever. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar also built these because his wife, who was from a tropical area, missed trees. So what did he do? Real simple. He made gardens in the middle of a desert. They were said to have incredible irrigation, that it was these trees, as you can see here, and basically flowing rivers. But when we kind of summarize all this, what we see in the Middle East is the development of empire and really warfare, that you're only as strong as your army and your economy. And that pretty much only lasts a certain amount of time. But the idea of having an empire and spreading it is something we're going to see. And we're going to see it with the Egyptians. We're going to see it later on in India. We're going to see it with the Persians. We're going to see it with the Greeks. And many of these influenced by this ancient culture. All right, so that's it for today. Make sure you took some notes, and I will see you tomorrow.